No way to avoid it, no way to sidestep or roll around it. Life has its moments of mud, moments of muck, some of which rotate and alternate, receding to reveal brilliance, some of which last and linger, obscuring all the good stuff for a time that is no longer kind. How might we live into the gratitude woven into the brilliant irreverence of Kurt Vonnegut, who riffs on the origin story that we humans were once mundane mud made conscience? Yet, and here's the kicker, among all the vast amounts of mud, we are the mud who got to sit up and look around. How good is our great fortune? How might we spend our days, at least more of them than not, singing how lucky we are? Even with shadows and muck, heartbreak and pain, how can we not love everything we see, or at least try? What if, when we cannot find our way to love everything we see, when we are spending too much time in the trenches of shadows, what if we practice how to move, even drag each other through salt and mud, because it is the only option? How might we become the people, each of us, but more so all of us as a united community who become what the poet Marge Piercy describes as straining in the mud and muck to move things forward, to be done, to do what has to be done again and again. How might we reach out to the ones we already know and love and to the ones we have yet to encounter on our journeys, being a reminder to each other that before spring becomes beautiful, it is nothing but mud and muck. And so it might be true in our lives when we experience hard times. Friends, it is good we gather. It is good we gather together, and it is good we gather together for this time of raising up that which is worthy. I invite Judy to come forward to help with the lighting of the chalice, and you too will help reading the words either in English or Spanish together. Encendemos este llama para recordarnos de la luz de la verdad, la calidez de la comunidad, and el fuego de compromiso. Good morning. Good morning to each of you here in the sanctuary and those of us joining at home. Welcome to worship at the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington this Sunday, April 28, 2024. I'm Judy Brook. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member of the worship associate team. We are a Unitarian Universalist faith community rooted here in the heart of Burlington in the Lake Champlain watershed. If you'd like to follow along with an order of service, you can scan the QR code in front of the green, the gray hymnal rather, or you can visit our website, uusociety.org and click the green button that says live stream service. There you'll find the order of service, as well as a button labeled new to our community. Because our services are videotaped, we invite anybody who doesn't want to be on tape to sit in our camera-free zone in the back seven pews on that side of the sanctuary. This religious society is guided not by a creed, but by the commitment to each other, to shared values that include justice, equity, pluralism, and generosity. Love is at the center of it all. 
We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We're all growing, all learning, all loved. We welcome all who are welcoming, and we hope you, experiencing, you experience connection and compassion and a feeling of coming home. If you are new to our community and you feel comfortable, would you raise your hand so we could extend a special welcome? Welcome. welcome. We have designated welcome ambassadors who are available to answer any questions you might have. Our welcome ambassadors today are Brian Haas and Susan Warner Mills. Brian and Susan, would you just, there they are. Thank you. If you'd like us to connect with you, you can fill out that new to our community card in the pew or on our, the form on our website. Um, announcements. Everyone is invited to join the coffee hour downstairs in the community room after the service, which you can reach through these doors and either by elevator or down the stairs at the end of the hall. We want to make sure you all know of this morning's Meet the Budget meeting here in the sanctuary and on Zoom, beginning at 11.30, more or less. <laughs> and you're invited to. Yeah. <laughs> Come learn about next year's budget, ask questions, and help us imagine and make real our future. Friends, whatever it took for you to get here, Wherever you're from, wherever you are, whatever burdens and joys you're carrying, you belong. Your whole self is welcome here. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. I'd like to invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing together this hymn, this chant together. It's a meditation on breathing. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it comes in three parts. The first goes like this. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. Sing that with me. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. There's another part that can go on top of that. That's the descant that you see there. It goes like this. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love with me. And one. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. And one, when I breathe out, I breathe out love. There's a last part that's just a drone, and it goes like this. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. I breathe out, I breathe out love. Sing whatever part you want. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in,
I'd love to invite anyone who's young or young at heart to come forward for a story about monkey poo. <laughs> now, the, this, the images that I'm going to show anybody who's brave enough to come forward will also be um, projected up there. But if you'll come up here, I would appreciate not being alone. Gosh. It's school vacation week. Thank you for your bravery. I appreciate it. Yay, yay. Okay, you might want to come closer because it's not, they're tiny little pictures. But so I just want to start with, yeah, come forward, come forward. If you had a choice about walking in monkey poo, would you? No, we got some no, really clear, like didn't even have to think about it. Okay, so, but what if, to get to this place, you had to walk through monkey poo. Can you see? It's kind of a really special place. It's a temple that's on top of something called Mount Popa. It's a volcanic plug that's next to an inactive volcano. Can you see that it's a really fancy, fancy building? It was built a long, long time ago. Now, I went there when I was in a class to become a minister. About 10 years ago, we went to a place called Myanmar, or Burma, and we studied Christian Buddhist dialogue, and we had a chance to go to that place. Now, this is a picture of it, again, but from further away. Do you see how it's on a kind of strange mountain that sort of sticks up? Some lava had been under the ground, and that ground was soft enough that it pushed up just in a big plug and became a little mountain near the actual Mount Popa because this place is actually called Ta Taung Kalat, and it's considered a spiritual hotspot where there's a lot of good energies that is recognized by different religions, including the Buddhists and people who practice not religion, N-A-T, who believe that everything is alive if it's trees are alive and rocks are alive. And in the temple that's at the top of that Taung Kalat, they have statues that show respect for both Buddhist deities and not deities. But to get up there, can you see? 777 stairs spiraling all around that volcanic plug. Now, anywhere in Myanmar, if you're going to go to a temple, you know what you have to do? You have to take off your shoes because you're going into a sacred place. Now, Myanmar is pretty darn warm, and so the shoes people are wearing are not these ones. They're like flip-flops. So when you take off your shoes, you're barefoot. So that's, and the, the temple, even though it's at the top, is considered to start at the very bottom of the stairs. So to go up those stairs, 777 of them, to get to this place, you have to walk barefoot. Now, I really wanted to go there. I was with a bunch of people, and some of them, they were like, no, thank you. 777, too much. Also, there was something on that Taung Kalat that they didn't really want to encounter, and I'm going to tell you about it. So half of them stayed in the group, and the other half of us, we walked up. I took off my flip-flops, and I started going up, and this 
is what we encountered. Can we show that picture so everyone sees? Monkeys live all over Ta'un Kalat, all over. It is their home. Humans are visitors there. They own it. And just like we do in our own homes, they pee and poop there. <laughs> and so, as you go up the stairs, and it happened to be raining on this day, <laughs> in bare feet, up 777 stairs, I had to walk in monkey pee and monkey poo to get to the top because I really, really, really wanted to see this place. And that was fine, walking up. I could do it, that was okay. I mean, it was a little gross. Actually, it was a lot gross, but I did it. But this is the thing, people who go to visit this place, they've been feeding the monkeys. And the monkeys are kind of like bold. They're like, ooh, I got fed before, will you feed me? And they're like, oh, you have something shiny that you're wearing, maybe it's a necklace, can I have it? <laughs> oh, and what's in that plastic bag that you're carrying? I want it. <laughs> These were not cute monkeys. I mean, there were mama monkeys and there were papa monkeys, there were baby monkeys, there were big monkeys and there were little monkeys. I thought they might be cute, but frankly, they reminded me of the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I was afraid. But okay, they kept their distance mostly. But it was raining. Do you remember how I said it was raining? So we went up to the top, did okay, but on the, on the backside, coming down 770, it was slippery. I was afraid that I was going to fall. But I was lucky. I had a friend. And you know what the friend did? The friend walked in front of me, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I put my other arm on the railing as we walked down. So I was walking very slow down, way different than when I was walking up because I was afraid I was going to slip. Do you know what one monkey did? Because I was wearing a plastic poncho to try to keep the rain off. That monkey thought that he wanted the poncho <laughs> and kept following very close, way closer than was comfortable. And you remember how I said I was like, holding onto the shoulder of my friend who was really helping me get through, and also had my hand on the railing so I wouldn't fall and slip. You know what that monkey did? It ran right down my arm trying to take my poncho off. But didn't take it, just freaked me out a little bit, and we kept going, making our way through the muck together, me and my friend, until we got to the bottom. And here we go. I got to wash my feet. <laughs> Thank goodness they had little basins to wash our feet in. So this is the lesson that I take from that story, that there are times in our lives when it's muddy, it's mucky. Hopefully there are no times in your lives when you have monkey poo around you. But it's always better if we go through those hard times together with other people. We lean on them or we let them lean on us. Thank you for listening to my story. It's time to sing you out to faith development. As you journey, As you journey may you know, may you know, love and hope go with you, love and hope go with you, learn and grow, learn and grow. As you journey as you journey may you know may you know love and hope go with you love and hope go with you learn and grow learn and grow learn and grow learn and grow I love to kayak. I look forward to it every summer, and I especially look forward to the three to four day trips I take every summer with a group of dear heart close friends, and we have wild adventures. I'd like to tell you about one though. This was up northeast of the Northeast 
kingdom, <laughs> where the loons yodel even more than that. And we had scoped out this wonderful clear pond and we were going to paddle it and then, then down a river that led out of that down to a nearby town. It was going to be an all day adventure. And so we got in our kayaks and started out through the lake. We found the entrance to the stream and started down the stream and we came to a beaver dam. We've done this before. So we climbed out of our kayaks onto the dam, pulled our kayaks up onto the dam, got them angled off the other side, climbed in and slid down the beaver dam back into the stream and went on our way. These women are all 70 plus, mind you. So off we go. We came to another beaver dam. We can repeat this, get off onto the dam, pull our kayaks up, get them angled down, get in and slide down the dam and continue on. There was a third dam and at that point we thought we'd better check and see what lay ahead of us. So my three friends stayed behind the dam and I got out onto the dam and went to the edge of the dam and I couldn't see around the corner so I stepped off and I sank up to mid thigh in thick clayey muck and I'm catching my balance and I know that if I fall I'll drown because it's got my leg in a vise of muck and I yell for my friends not to come because it's not safe. I've also got my shoe down there and I know that I will need it on my feet if I'm lucky enough to get back on the dam and get back to the lake. So I brace my paddle carefully on part of the dam and ever so slowly, ever so slowly, pry my leg out of the muck and get it with my shoe on. It was a crock, oh God. <laughs> Onto the dam where it's a little firmer and I climb back up on the, on the dam and I say, it's dams all the way down. <laughs> we better turn around and enjoy our day back on the lake. So, we get back in our kayaks and we paddle upstream, mind you, to the second dam that we hit. And two of our friends went ahead and I'm standing on this dam. I had a friend whose, whose kayak had partially filled with water. And so we tilted her dam up on end and pulled the drain plug. And we think, this trip can't get any worse than this. <laughs> and then we saw the leeches. So, we did make it back, but I want to just leave you with the thoughts of when you get into really nasty, dangerous or mucky situations, I hope you have good friends with you. I hope you have safety gear. I hope you have a sense of adventure a sense of self-preservation and the ability to handle the leeches and to laugh <laughs> because sometimes that's all you can do is laugh. Thanks. <laughs>
Spiritual practices come in many forms within our Sunday service. Generosity, spoken meditation, stillness. Music, creating space for our joys, for our sorrows, and for gratitude. In this portion of our Sunday service, each of us will have the chance to enter into those communal practices to which we are drawn and to hold space and to offer our loving witness for each other. Just as a justice-seeking spiritual community, our generosity practice includes sharing half the offering each Sunday. Offerings this month will be shared with the Innervale Center, a dynamic nonprofit in Burlington, Vermont, that implements innovative, rep replicatable, and place-based solutions to address some of global agriculture's most pressing problems. They are transforming the food system from one that is degrading, anonymous, and industrial, to one that is restorative, familiar, and human scale. They are working to foster a local food economy that is good for people and for the planet. I invite you to find a posture that allows you to receive, to soften, to be ready for possibility, for insight, grief, or joy, to find their shape within you. That and more or less at this time of stillness that some call meditation and some call prayer. Into this circle of care, we give voice to the joy that David Call was approved for a Section 8 voucher, which makes life more affordable. He'll be staying in the apartment he already lives in and loves. Also into the circle of care, the joy, the determination, and the effort buoyed by friends of Adam and his wonderful play that debuted last night in South Burlington, I think. And also the joy of member John Soleil, who is steadily working his way to become a UU minister and army chaplain. He completes his clinical pastoral education at UVM this Friday and graduates from Meadville Lombard Seminary on May 19th. His path won't be complete with those two major accomplishments, but he is so close and we express our gratitude for his fortitude and his persistence and his presence among us. In this place and among this people, we note that on Wednesday, some of us mark Beltane, the midway point between spring equinox and summer solstice. May spring keep coming. <laughs> May summer be more gentle this year with us. Let us give praise to the students rising up, building encampments, pressing academic institutions, and frankly, pressing all of us in American society to move beyond confusion or outrage or not wanting to pick a side about what is happening in Gaza. Let us do what we can to support, as of yesterday, 49 encampments, knowing just two days before that it was 26, knowing that history rarely, if ever, favors, not in the long run, those who send in the National Guard to quell dissent. Into this circle of care we bring grief and worry for all the transitions of staff that are taking place here at First UU. In a few weeks, we say goodbye to Blake, our current facilities manager, who found his way in just this past year into our hearts. And just this past week, we learned of two other staff transitions that after five years, James will be moving on and out of his role as director of music. 
This is the sigh of people who do not read the e news. <laughs> My love to you all. And I am sorry, but I am glad you hear it from me. Then the next one also may be news to you that our budget challenges will not allow the position that Rowan currently occupies to continue next year. So much change, too much change. Some days it feels like it, and yet this is the very essence of life, change. And we will get through it together. In that spirit, let us spend a few moments in shared stillness together, connecting to those prayers that flutter within our own hearts until the chime rings again. Amen. When the music plays in just a moment, we invite you to come forward to silently mark a joy, a sorrow, or a gratitude in your life by moving a stone from one of the bowls onto the cloth in the center, creating a representation of our shared lives at this special fleeting moment. As you are moved, please come forward along the side aisles and leave through the center aisle. If you have a gift to add to the offering, there are baskets at the heads of each of the aisles. Or you can make your offering online. If you are at home or you want to remain seated, we invite you to lean into the music as an opportunity for stillness and centering as it made, makes sense to you.
Please join me with our words for dedication of our offering. With gratitude, we dedicate these gifts in the service of our mission to inspire spiritual growth, care for each other and our community, seek truth, and act for justice. So I feel the need to warn you, especially since the Flynn announced, I think just last week, that um, their Broadway series next year is going to include Hades Town, right? So it's coming here in October, that this sermon contains spoilers. <laughs> now, I don't feel especially badly about this because the show is based on an ancient Greek myth that's been around for a while. So. You've had a chance. Now, before I attended, I did what I do when I go to see Shakespeare, which is I read a synopsis, because otherwise I am lost. So I read the synopsis, and I knew it would end tragically. And still, the music and the acting, and the set, and the theatrics of it all, the energy and the music vibrating in my body and throughout the audience, the hope of collective liberation that rose up from the narrative that reached a crescendo that enthralled so much that when the ending came, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that the lovers were permanently and irrevocably separated. I was devastated. It did not matter that I knew it ahead of time. It did not matter that it was a story being told on stage. I was suffering along with the characters. I sat in my seat tears streaming down my cheeks and I thought if I was still enough, disbelieving enough, a surprise ending would appear. Perhaps stage, stage left, saving me from my despondency and you know sometimes that happens in Hollywood and sometimes on Broadway, but it didn't happen. Orpheus looked back and in so doing consigned his beloved Eurydice to live in hell for all eternity. This is not what I wanted for Orpheus and Eurydice. It is not what I want for me. It is not what I want for you. It is not what I want for generations to come. It is not what I want for any creature, near or far, known or unknown. It is not what I want for this magnificent planet. Back in the theater, realizing the playwright was staying true to the myth, which I respect, I found myself that I was holding my breath waiting and wanting. I wanted a different ending. And then I remembered to breathe. And as I did so, in and out, I could see that wanting. And it was then that I observed my longing for something different than what was. It was then that the tragedy was still with me, but no longer in me. Then the narrator, Hermes, confirmed for the whole audience, it's a sad song, he sang. It's a sad tale. It's a tragedy. It's a sad song, but we sing it anyway. Because here's the thing. 
to know how it ends and still begin to sing it again. What are we to do with tragedy, with suffering? Are we to walk up a daunting number of nearly impossible stairs spiraling along a sheer-sided volcanic plug on steps that are tiled and wet with rain and monkey pee and poo, only to realize that when we reach the top, we have to come back down again? Are we to keep living in a world on fire in these mortal bodies that give so much, but also that take so much from us, of us? This mortal life is full of tragedy and suffering, though some of it may want to call it a different name, maybe call it muck. I have heard some people who are unfamiliar with Buddhism or familiar in a kind of cursory way say that Buddhism believes life is suffering. Like, amen, life is suffering. Which is such a downer. And so they want to keep a distance because it's a downer. And in fact, Buddhism does begin with Buddha's statement that life is suffering, but that is just one of the four noble truths. Starting and stopping there is like starting and stopping with the first of the 12 steps. Admitting you have a problem and that life has become unmanageable and then be done with it. (laughs) In the world of recovery, there are 11 more steps. Yes, that is right. Amen. Yes. And in Buddhism, there are three more noble truths. So yes, the first is that life is suffering. In Pali, the word is dukkha, which sounds a lot like monkey poo to me. (laughs) The second noble truth names the cause of dukkha, the cause of suffering. The third noble truth, having named that there is a cause of suffering, proclaims that suffering can come to an end. And the fourth noble truth is the path that brings suffering to an end according to that tradition. This is a good reminder that it can be problematic to think you know a thing when only you know the thing in part. Right? So suffering is a big word, it's intimidating, it's heavy, it's a downer. So, and there are theologies out there that pair suffering with redemption, which is super problematic. So there are good reasons to give wide berth to that pairing. So I want to invite us to think of a different word, right? This word muck as a way for us to consider the presence of suffering in our lives. Because sometimes it's personal and sometimes it's interpersonal. Sometimes the source of muck is random and sometimes it is intended and cruel. Sometimes it comes from systemic oppressions, adding both acute challenges and a chronic layer as barrier, both external and internal. And so I ask the question again, how do we make the most of muck? Especially in April in Vermont, mud season. And especially this month where our earth teacher had been muck and mud. The late Buddhist monk and wise teacher Titnat Han tells us that without mud, there is no lotus. Without the very smelly mud at the bottom of the river, there is no fragrant, beautiful flower. That the path of transforming suffering is possible and is within us, accessible through the practice of mindfulness. It's that breath that allows just enough space for us to know that there is suffering, but it need not define all aspects 
of ourselves. It's the breath that allows us to know that suffering is temporary, that it gives way to joy or at least to a neutral state, just as joy gives way and neutrality gives way. It's the sad song of our mortal lives. It's that breath that allows us to see that suffering and happiness are not polar opposites, but are woven of the same cloth. Like the mud that gives way to the lotus that eventually withers and returns to the mud. Did not Han uses that image to help us know that suffering and happiness do not exist one without the other, but they are in a constant state of flux. He says happiness and suffering are not enemies, they inter are. Happiness and suffering are not enemies, they inter are. The possibility of transforming our relationship with suffering comes not from the fact that mindfulness exists, but from practicing it over time. Usually, unless you're really close to enlightenment, long periods of time. In her essay of Mud and Broken Windows, Michelle McDonald Smith writes these words, I have been practicing Buddhist meditation for 21 years, and this journey reminds me of how long it takes a tree to grow, bear fruit, and reach maturity. She tells this story. My family and I planted a mango tree together 12 years ago in Honolulu. It grew slowly the first five or six years, then it started growing very quickly. It grew quite tall, but didn't flower. Two years ago, it flowered, but we had no fruit. Last year, we had baby mangoes, and we were so excited, but they didn't mature. It takes time for a tree to grow strong enough to bear fruit, to hold the fruit to maturity. And this year, she concludes, we had 12 delicious golden mangoes. Out of mud comes the lotus, out of soil comes golden mangoes, but only over time. At this point in the sermon, I feel like it's important for me to say a couple of things about the nature of suffering, at least from my point of view, because I want you to know that this sermon is not suggesting that if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. I am not a pastor who will ever tell you that everything happens for a reason. There is some suffering that is too much suffering. Too much in length, too much in depth, too much cruelty. And if you have experienced this, I am sorry it happened to you, is happening to you, you do not deserve it. I also want to say that acceptance of the fact of suffering, choosing to embrace it rather than resist it, is not approval of the pain or its source. Approval or consent are quite different than mindful acceptance. Suffering is not a good thing, but it is a thing. And when we try to deny any reality, to when we try to come up with alternative facts, that effort leads to spiritual bypassing, to dysfunction, to chaos, and writ large, sometimes the unopening for fascism. So what could a mindful embrace of suffering look like in our lives? Titnat Han encourages us to speak these words. Breathing in, I know suffering is there. Breathing out, I say hello to my suffering. 
listen again to these simple words. Breathing in, I know suffering is there. Breathing out, I say hello to my suffering. For those of you at home or here in the sanctuary, if you'd like to join me, I'll say it once again. And for those who do not want to join in, that is well and good too. Breathing in, I know suffering is there. Breathing out, I say hello to my suffering. Titnat Han says that when a parent hears a baby crying, and maybe this is true for a congregation too, the natural thing to do is to take that child into their arms, not suppressing or judging or ignoring the crying, but cradling the baby with utter tenderness. Mindfulness, he says, is like a parent embracing suffering without judgment, like a parent who says, hello, my suffering, I know you're here. Or good morning, my pain, my sorrow, I see you, no need to worry. Or this is what I say to myself, Hello, my own suffering. You may sit beside me, but you may not reside in me. You may sit beside me, you may not reside in me. I like to think that this works not only for individuals, but for ever larger groups of people, for couples bringing intentionality to their relationship, to, for families going through a rough patch to not let that rough patch become the narrative of who they are. Even for congregations going through challenges such as budget worries or significant staff transitions, or a congregation that has an association with someone who commits a hateful act of violence. Suffering, you may sit beside me, but you cannot reside in me. I think it's also at play when folks who experience systemic oppressions refuse to give up the right to joy, insist on full ex access to a fulfilling life, proclaim the necessity for rest. And I think it's here that I want to share a quote from the book, No Mud, No Lotus. It's about how we all need each other at one time or another, or perhaps all the time, to get through the muck of our lives. Titnat Han wrote, quote, there are times when a case of suffering is so great it needs recognition from more than one person. We all need help sometimes when suffering threatens to overwhelm us. And we can borrow the collective energy of mindfulness of a group of practitioners in order to recognize and embrace the block of suffering in us. And he concludes, when suffering has become a seemingly impenetrable obstacle, we can learn how to draw on the support of others. Before I bring the sermon to a close, I want to tell you about this stool. The fabric of it comes from Inlay Lake in Myanmar, in Burma. I brought it back with me, and when I was ordained, one of the con ordaining congregations made it into a stole. It's one I usually wear when I officiate weddings. I don't know if you can see, and if you can't, I hope you'll come forward at the end of the service when I stand up here all awkward and you could look at it closer. <laughs> but it has rows that alternate, and these are alternating between silk that comes from the more traditional source, silk worms, and silk that comes from the lotus root, which is an industry in Myanmar that a lot of women do amazing weavings with, pulling off the outer casing of the lotus root and finding within their fibers and then turning them into silk. I think of this as the alternating warp and weft of suffering and happiness, woven of the same cloth, 
muck and magnificence coexisting. So let us see if we can live into the wise Buddhist teaching that the art of happiness is also the heart, art of suffering well. Let us begin to sing again, even if it is a tragedy, and even if we know how it ends. And as we move through the muck and mud of our lives, should any of us find ourselves with bare feet moving in the midst of decidedly unpleasant matter, May there be a beautiful temple or a fragrant lotus awaiting us, even if it is only eventually, and on the way there seems far and daunting. May we have with us, whether in joy or suffering, good companions to hold us up and upon whom we can lean. So be it. See to it. Amen. invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing our closing hymn together lean on me you'll find it in the teal hymnal in page 1021 we also have the words on the overhead sometimes in our lives we all have pain we all have sorrow but if we are wise we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be okay. I'll help you carry on, for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody. join me in words to extinguish our chalice. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of communion, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts to share with the world until we are together again. May you know the blessing you already are. May you sense the blessing you yet can be. And may we all go out and be a blessing in the world.